Hello and welcome to the newspapers, The Week in Review. This is the show where we look at the weekly newspapers. My name is Mike Mendoza and each week I'll be here at this time with a special guest to look in detail at the stories that are hitting the headlines in our region today. Well, my guest reviewer is Pat Beresford. He's Cabinet Member for Regeneration on Ada District Council. Pat's portfolio and responsibility is pretty enormous, as I'm sure you realise. Pat, welcome to you. Thank you, Michael. I mean, I was looking through some of the things you do and I didn't realise exactly how big the job is. Yeah, it is, it is a, uh, a big job. It's an important job, and it's, it's probably one of the most emotive of the Cabinet uh, member jobs because it carries responsibility for, particularly for planning, mm -hmm. uh, which is always in the headlines. Um, at the moment, we're working hard with flood prevention work, um, repairing a lot of the damage done last winter. That, again, is my responsibility, together with the economic regeneration of ADA. Um, so, yeah, it's a big portfolio. Not complaining because uh, I enjoy it immensely, and, and I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy it. It's a good job you retired, wasn't it, really? Yes, I couldn't do it if I wasn't retired. <laughs> <laughs> I retired to take another job. I see, exactly, yeah. that's what it seems like. So how much do you have to work with Brighton & Hove? Quite a lot, mm -hmm. quite a lot. Um, we, we formed quite a, a, a good working partnership with Brighton & Hove, who are, are our neighbours, and we brought them in to an organisation that we were already members of, Ada, which is called Coastal West Sussex. Mm -hmm which is Chichester, Arran, Worthing and Ada originally, but it was a nonsense not to have Brighton and Hove at that table and Lewis as well, Lewis District Council. So we brought them both into the fold and so we meet regularly uh, with Brighton and Hove City Council, both around the table with other authorities, but also I've had a lot of meetings directly with uh, the planners and, and members uh, at, at, at uh, uh, Worthing and Brighton because they are our immediate neighbours and in planning grounds, we must demonstrate that we are talking to and cooperating with our neighbour authorities. Wasn't there recently a large chunk of money that came your way or in fact Brighton's way, which has to be shared amongst the whole group? Yes, I mean, it, it didn't come to Brighton for Brighton to, to make decisions on sharing it out. It came to the great, what's called the Greater Brighton area, mm -hmm. of which we were part. And yes, some of that money has come uh, to Ada and we're using it primarily for flood prevention work up the River Ada and in the, the Shoreham Harbour. Uh -huh. And it was pretty bad, as you said, last year. Oh, uh, the yeah. forecast, of course, for the next 12 months doesn't look too good either. No, no. So but, I mean, we, we, we drew down money from the government uh, for emergency repairs, um, uh, which were going on at this very moment, uh, to hope that, in the hope that we don't face the same problems that we faced last winter. But, of course, if you're a coastal authority and a river as well, a tidal river in your mm -hmm. area, you are always vulnerable, uh, as we found out last winter. Okay, let's move on to some of the stories that are making the headlines. Uh, story one, the headlines from the Herald this week very much involve you, Pat. Uh, Council unveils plans for tax freeze. Yeah. Your thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't say there's a decision because we can't actually take the decision yet until we formally set the budget. But that's our target. That's what we're working towards, is a fourth year of no increase in the council tax. In fact, in last year it was a reduction of 1%. Yes, it was. Mm. Yeah, which, I mean, it, it was quite unusual uh, in the present circumstances for a council uh, to be doing that. But it, it takes a lot of hard work by a lot of people because it's not simply a case of doing nothing and therefore not having a rise. You have to do a lot to avoid the need for a rise because if inflation uh, affects your budget, then to have no increase means that you have to face up to a, a decrease in your amount of money because inflation has eaten, in, eaten into mm -hmm. some of that money. So how can you do it but other councils can't? I, can't, I don't know. I can't speak for other councils, mm -hmm. but we... Well, you must be doing something different. Well, we're a frugal yeah. council for a start. Yeah. Um, well, it's we, the lowest paid council, or, or the council's well, the lowest paid council, in the country. Council's yeah. are the lowest, one of the lowest yeah. paid group of councils in the country. Mm. But there's lots of other things that we don't spend money on. Uh, rightly or wrongly, people might say, but we have, we have a very low-key approach to having a mayor, because we don't have a mayor, we have a chairman of council. But the chairman of council, as you know from your past experiences, uh, has to do it on a shoestring. Very little pomp and very little ceremony in Ada. Uh, we just try to get on with the job. 
Okay, let's move on to another story. Uh, th this one is, again, it really does affect your ear as well because the A27 is, is, is pretty awful at times. But this one, uh, the headline in the Argus this week, 31 crashes in just 13 hours. Uh, police will notice of deadly road conditions after storms. I mean, why is this happening? Well, I think primarily because a lack of experience. Uh, you, sometimes with, with driving conditions, you can't experience the worst until the worst happens. Um, and, and I think it called a lot of people out by a combination of the autumn leaves together with a high rainfall that the drainage system couldn't manage uh, in, the, in the time. And so people were meeting unusual and new circumstances. I think a lot of it was that. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 don't, I don't particularly think people were going mad for those 13 hours. I just think a lot of people got caught out with very unusual road conditions, to be quite honest. So people not driving to the conditions, really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe lack, of, lack of, t of, of education in that. Yeah. Without a doubt. I guess we move on to another story now. This is about a dying girl unable to wear a wig in lessons. Uh, this is a story about a terminally ill girl who also suffers uh, from alopecia, who was reportedly forced by a teacher to remove a wig she wore to school. This is a very cruel story. I think, it, I think it's, it's both cruel and silly, to be quite honest, because um, if it's true that the teacher gave, the reason the teacher gave, which was that other girls might want to dye their hair pink, I think it's slightly ludicrous because if you look at the poor child and the condition that she, she lives in, mm -hmm. it's no secret to anybody. You just have to, you, you can just see that she's a very ill young lady and, and the need for the wig is also apparent. And I can't, I can't for the life of me see why such a draconian decision needed to be made. It baffles me if it's true, it really does. Okay, you've got doubts that it might not be true. Well, you know, the, it's, the, the newspaper likes a good story, mm -hmm. let's say, the Argus likes a Never good story. Never let the facts get in the way of a good story, Absolutely, though. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, here's another one. This is Cycle Lanes Blamed for Homes Flooding. Uh, again, uh, residents are blaming the flooding in their homes on cycle lanes. Uh, we don't, of course, suffer from that in Adrian Worthing, but uh, very much Brighton and Hove, well, where the roads are continuously being dug up uh, to put in cycle lanes. Oh, we, well, yeah, we don't have cycle lanes on our roads in Adrian because we, we, the cycle lanes that we have are off-road uh, along the coastal strip. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know the facts about that one. Uh, you know, a surveyor and an engineer could explain more, but um, Brighton have looked at it and said that it's, it's not the cycle lanes that are doing it. Um, it's a bit strange if it does, because it means that somebody's made a horrendous mistake when they put them in, if that's the reality of it, mm -hmm. to simply put in a cycle lane has changed the, the path and the nature of how water is taken off of the road and disposed of. Um, I mean, it, it needs to be proven, to be quite honest. Hasn't this happened in, in a similar way on the A27, certainly going through Lansing, uh, where flooding has been particularly bad at times? Yeah, that was, that was nothing to do with the cycle lane. No, that no, was, I'm just saying... That was trying to manage too. the water coming off the downs. That uh, Water always wants to flow downhill. Mm -hmm. um, and in Ada, the water was trying hard, as hard as it could to flow downhill, which included trying to get across the A27. And in doing so, it was flooding the A27 between the Sussex Bad and the Manor Roundabout, um, we're assured it's been fixed. I, I saw an announcement, or a, a, a thing that came out yesterday, uh, that the authorities are saying that homeowners are responsible for free-flowing water onto their properties. Yeah. Are, are you aware of that? Yeah, it's called riparian responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's come to a head now because the county council, who are the... Uh, the responsible authority for land flooding mm -hmm. or la management of water drainage off the land. Um, and they've made it quite clear they cannot afford to service all the drainage ditches that make the difference in parts of Ada, particularly in Lansing. And so they are now embarking upon a programme of drawing it to the attention of every householder who has a drainage ditch particularly the traditional drainage ditches at the end of their property, that mm -hmm. they have the responsibility for keeping that ditch clear. Uh, it's not something that's been publicised enough in the past, but it's certainly yeah. being publicised now. 
I think obviously they needed to do. Let's quickly get on to another one, another yeah. story. This is developer's fourth bid to convert pub. This is about a developer is hoping for its fourth time lucky uh, in converting a disused family pub into housing. Uh, Home-based developer Tim Martin has made a fourth bid to convert a Woodingdean pub site into a recently submitted application. Uh, highly critical of councillors' flawed decision to refuse permission for a similar proposal less than two months ago. Again, you, you, you're well up on, on planning. You have been for many years. Yeah. Uh, it, this, this is, this is, I think, uh, this is happening more and more uh, 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 in all parts of the country. This issue because pubs are closing at quite a rate. Yeah. Um, but the, the 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 way the law has been framed at the moment, it's more suitable for rural villages and towns um, where the pub has a pivotal role in a community. But that law doesn't seem to, or that regulation doesn't interpret very well in an urban area where the prime reason a pub closes is because it's not making enough money, either for the licensee or for the brewery if they own it. Um, and to, you can't force a, cub, a pub to stay open if it's not trading well enough. That's why so many are turning into supermarkets exactly. and, and there's no, yeah. no, no planning involved in that. But no. We've got to move on, I'm afraid. Right. Uh, time for a break. When we return, we look at other stories that are hitting the headlines in our region. This is the New Papers and the Week in Review. My special guest is Pat Beresford, Cabinet Member for Regeneration on Ada District Council. We'll be back after the break. Don't go away. Well, welcome back to the newspapers in the Week in Review with me, Mike Mendoza, and my guest, Pat Beresford, Cabinet Member for Regeneration on Ado District Council. Uh, Pat, we were talking before the break there about a developer's fourth bid to convert pub, and I briefly touched on the, the question of so many supermarkets taking over pubs. How easy is this for them to do? It doesn't come under planning, does it, apparently? No. Um, the, 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 there are things called what are called use class orders, and the use class order from a pub to a local supermarket doesn't require a planning permission, providing it's the same footprint, i.e. they use the same building, don't extend the building, um, then they can switch it from uh, a pub straight to a supermarket uh, without planning permission. Uh, that's the law. Um, there's not, and there's no way that a local authority can intervene. I mean, I don't know the details of this particular pub, but I've seen other similar cases where the, the case is being made for a community use or a community role for a pub which isn't really appropriate in a city or in, in, in let's say in Worthing um, it just doesn't wash in the same way as if you were living in a rural village mm -hmm. and there was only one pub that was covering off an awful lot of functions in of that course, village yeah. Yeah. then that's what the argument is about for community use not for I'm afraid it doesn't work so well in a town um, I don't make any I don't take a view about the decision that the members have taken on that one because I don't particularly know the details of the case, but I know it's made life difficult for urban areas, for the planning authorities in urban areas, um, because the decision that they're faced with is, is, is not one that matches up, if you like, to the environment in which they're trying to work. OK, let's look at the headlines in the Argus. Uh, second brother, 17, killed in Syria. Yet another uh, young lad has been killed in Syria, going over there to fight. Uh, you know, what's wrong with these kids? What's, what's going on here? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure there's anything wrong with, with the kids. I think it's a, an unfortunate situation with... A lot of it, I think, it comes about from the access to social media these days, where there's a, an awful lot of information, an awful lot of reading that is aimed at teenagers in mm -hmm. this country, but particularly, I think, young Muslim teenagers in this country, that they have unfettered access to, and nobody knows really what effect it's having on them and whether they're involved or engaged in it or not. I mean, I've listened to these, the, the father of these boys a couple of times on the TV and on the radio, and I feel very sad because I don't think you can point the finger at the parents and say you should have known, because you ask any parent of teenage boys what they're looking at, what they're up to, who they're meeting, who they're talking with, and any parent will say, I don't really know all that much about what my 17-year-old lad is reading and yep. who he's meeting. I think it's very sad, and I, I, I do think the, the, these, we have to be careful about pointing the finger at the parents 
or at the lads as well and saying you should have known better. Is, is it misguided or they, is it well, that I, religion it, has taken them yeah, over? I, I, I think they're mis I don't think it's religion that's taken them over because I don't think if you if you listen to the leaders in the Muslim Muslim community in this country, they're certainly not supportive of what's going on with this indoctrination of young people. Um, and I'm not sure how easy it is going to be to manage it because the, the, the way the social media has grown now, who is actually managing what social media pumps out? Yeah, yeah. And it's very sad. I mean, his brother, 18, was yeah, killed. Now horrible. you've got 17. That's two children in, yeah, in one family. Yeah, it's a horrible family. story for those must two be teenage awful. boys. And the, yeah. the government, of course, said that they will be considered as terrorists when they come yep. back. Well, if there's a third one, third brother out there, that's still, as far as I know, he's still alive, and yeah. he will be treated as a terrorist when he comes back, because that's the law. Very sad. Okay, let's move on to another one. This is a, a double page feature uh, actually in the Argus. Is park and ride the answer to cutting congestion? Now, you, part of your portfolio, of course, is traffic. Yeah, highway, yeah, yeah. Not parking, I'm glad to say. <laughs> <laughs> not part of my portfolio, which is, is not a particularly thorny one in Ada, actually, but um, I mean, we'd, we've never experienced park and ride because we're not that sort of a coastal authority that has a, an enormous focus on mm. shopping at, at one particular centre. Ours is much more spread out around the district. But the trouble with park and ride is you either have to have a draconian regime to stop drivers bringing their car into the centre. Otherwise, you, how do you get people to use park and rides if they don't want to? Yeah. You know, it's rain, you, get up, you get up on Saturday morning, it's pouring of rain, you don't really want to go to a car park somewhere miles away and stand in, and then stand in the of, rain yeah. to get on a bus yeah. to, to get into town. Um, you want to get in your car and drive to where you want to be to shop because that's what you've got your car for. Well, Brighton Hove has been described as being car unfriendly and, and the way they're sort of narrowing roads now and widening pavements, uh, making bus lanes which block up traffic, that certainly is unfriendly. It appears to be, and I have to say that I, I find it more and more difficult to uh, come to meetings and drive into Hove and drive into Brighton uh, I mean, unless you start out very early or you leave very late, um, it, it, it does seem to be a very congested city now. Um, so I'm not sure what the solutions are. And one can't blame Brighton and Hove for looking at all the possible solutions. So a, a, a pretty, I mean, it, it's, they're a regional shopping centre, Brighton, and, and one should not be surprised that you get a lot of people. But it puts, I mean, personally, it puts me off coming into Brighton. To be, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I, if I come into Brighton, I drive my car down to the seafront in Lansing, park it there and then get on the 700, get the 700. bus. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but you, you've probably got a bus pass. I certainly you? have. Yeah. <laughs> that helps. OK, uh, also in the Argus, council tax is set to go up uh, to pay for the police. Uh, and the amount of residents pay for policing is expected to rise for the second year running. Finance chiefs need the money to fully implement plans proposed when they're asked for a bigger raise uh, they got last year. Now, there you are with the council, your council, who's either freezing or reducing council tax. Then you get a West Sussex County Council or East Sussex County Council and the police and the fire bringing it up again. Yeah, uh, it, it, the, the effect it has on us is that because we, we, the, the local council, i.e. in our case, Ada District Council, are the collection authority. Mm -hmm. So they collect their own council tax and in, in parts of Ada they also collect the parish council tax and then they, they collect the fire, they collect the police, they collect the county tax. So when a tax bill falls through the letterbox of somebody from Ada District Council, it's difficult for them to understand that that is not a demand from Ada District Council, it's mm. a demand that they're making on behalf of a, a, a number of other authorities. And in terms of the, the, the tax take that the police want to make, or the police commissioner wants to make, it's up to them to argue the case as to whether it's justified or not. Is the police value for money? I when, think when you see police stations closed, yeah, I th less I, police on the streets. Yeah, I, I think they're, they're, they're symptomatic of, of an organisation trying to run on a reduced budget and trying to, always to try and reduce that budget year on year. Mm -hmm. um, and I think basically the, the, the police 
they do a good job. Uh, and it's not, it's not a job that I'd ever fancy doing, to be quite frank. Mind you, we won't mention your old job, but it's also a job a lot of people wouldn't fancy doing either. Um, <laughs> planes are flying dangerously low. Again, this affects you because you live in the area. Yeah. Uh, this is literally a complaint from residents uh, claiming that taking off and landing at Shoreham Airport is dangerously low over their homes. But this has always happened, surely. Uh, well, I, I, live close, I live quite close to Shoreham Airport, mm. um, and I'm, I'm always conscious of the fact that planes are flying over. Um, I can't say I've noticed any differences myself in terms of uh, the height that uh, planes are landing or taking off and, and manoeuvring at. I haven't, I haven't noticed any difference where I live, which is to the west of the airport. Um, and if, people, if, 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 those, if those complaints have substance to them, then it has to go via the proper authority. We might be the planning authority, but we have no power or no responsibility for the, 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 the actions of running an airport on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. That lies with the licensed authority for, for running an airport and the Civil Aviation Authority who manage that licensing process. So there's, I mean, I'd be interested to know more about it. Well, there is a legal requirement on how, how high and low Absolutely, uh, aircraft yeah. can fly. Yeah, mm. um, I mean, and it's, it's a very technical process. The, 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 the approaches uh, that are required to be, to, to be used at Shoreham Airport, and I don't know if it's being abused at all, to be quite honest. If it genuinely is, I'm quite happy uh, to do what I can th through the channels, in, in, as far as the airport are concerned, but it's not something that we can directly affect. Okay, we've done planes, we've done automobiles. Let's move on now to, uh, to boats. Uh, <laughs> this is again, this is actually from the Herald. Uh, Port's plans for wind turbines is flagship scheme. Wasn't this turned down a long time ago to put turbines yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, along I, I'm the not, port? I'm not sure where the, the flagship bit comes in with a couple of wind turbines. I, I think that's over-egging the pudding a bit. It's a... Uh, it's a, a commercial operation that wants to do something to maybe lower its carbon footprint. Um, I've seen a number of schemes recently. I saw one in Ramsgate at the port there recently, but they're utilising water to generate electricity and to make themselves, their carbon footprint smaller. Um, this is more intrusive. Okay, well, unfortunately we've run out of time. Okay. Would you believe? I'm sorry about that. Uh, that's all the time we've got time for. Grateful thanks to Councillor Pat Beres for joining me today. Uh, Pat, we do hope to see you again here soon. I hope you're willing to come back yeah. again. Uh, I'm back next time for another edition of the newspapers and the Week in Review uh, here on Latest TV. Next week uh, will be Hazel Thorpe, prospective parliamentary candidate for Worthing West. Bye now.